Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Golan. I'm executive director of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. Thank you for being here. This is the second in our ongoing series of Life, the Universe, and Humanistic Judaism, which is featuring the rabbis and cantors in our movement. And I, um, we made this exclusive for SHJ members, meaning folks who are either members in one of our affiliated in-person communities or congregations, or SHJ independent members, because we do have members who do not live near any of our affiliated communities, but are able to join us and our movement by becoming a member of SHJ. And I'm happy to report that overall in our movement, membership is up. And when we measure it every September, you know, it's constant flux, but um, I've looked back, our Membership numbers this past September were the highest they've been since 2013, so in a decade. So it's a, it's a modest number still, but it's exciting that we're growing our membership and we're trying to do more of these kind of programs as a show of appreciation for the folks who are being supportive of us through their membership or through their donations. So thank you for that. Thank you for being a member. And um, we hope that you will find meaning in, in the programming that we do. And today we're thrilled to have Rabbi Jeffrey Shesnell with us um, to present on the Holocaust and humanistic Judaism. Uh, Rabbi Shesnell has served as the ceremonial and spiritual leader of Oradam Humanistic Congregation in Phoenix, Arizona since 2013. He is also the associate director of the Arizona Jewish Historical Society, a board officer of the Hans Park Conservancy, a member of the Association of Humanistic Rabbis and the Phoenix Board of Rabbis, and serves on the Arizona Interfaith Committee. Jeffrey earned a BA from Roosevelt University, a master's degree in Jewish studies from the Spiritus Institute for Jewish Studies, and received his rabbinic ordination from the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism in April 2022. So Jeffrey, thank you for being here. I'm going to spotlight you for everybody and take it away and let me know if you need anything. Uh, thank you, Paul. And thank you all for joining us uh, today for this uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I will be presenting a slideshow uh, PowerPoint and then people may add uh, their comments, questions and ideas that we would love to incorporate into the totality of the important subject that's being addressed. So again, thank you very much. Uh, Paul's given me a wonderful intro. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I will tell you that at the Arizona Jewish Historical Society, where I tend to spend my days, as opposed to weekends and evenings with Oradam, um, I am also the project manager of a planned Holocaust education center here in Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the country and without a Holocaust education center or museum. Mm -hmm. And it's high time that uh, Phoenix had one. Uh, the city agreed and helped by giving this project $2 million uh, of city funds um, we've had other major contributions from a couple of trusts and foundations, one of which is the material claims against uh, Germany, uh, who also gave us a million dollars. And we have a very benevolent donor who made a significant contribution, and the new center will be named after his family. Uh, we've raised over $16 million dollars. Um, and we're building a $30 million project. And it's a rather ambitious project, and it's being designed, the, the center is being designed by world-famous uh, museum designers, uh, Gallagher and Associates. They, uh, they designed the ANU, the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv. They uh, designed portions of the U.S., Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., the World War II Museum in uh, New Orleans, et cetera. So this promises to be 
oh, the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, the New York Heritage Center. So this promises to be an enormously significant uh, enterprise. And also we are inviting all of you to come to the opening in August of 2026. We'll break ground at the end of next year. It'll take a year to build and then another six months to install the exhibits and the technology. So uh, that occupies a great deal of my waking hours. Uh, with regard to marrying this work to uh, humanistic Judaism, uh, Paul didn't mention that I am what seems at times a lifelong member of SHJ, uh, having uh, done so since 1975, which is probably longer than some of the people on this call are even alive, and a past president of the SHJ, I'm proud to say, and have known Miriam Jarris for most of or all of that time. Uh, and know Paul since his uh, joining the organization. So um, I'm steeped in humanistic Judaism uh, and in, in the Holocaust. So that's why I've selected this topic. Um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to start the uh, PowerPoint, but let you know that if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll be happy to send it to you as a PDF file. Uh, just email me and I will be more than happy to share it. And it can be used uh, locally if you wish, or just shared um, even within your, your own small circle. Uh, so if we can now begin. So the, the humanistic lessons of the Holocaust really revolve around people's choices that have been made, and it really does make all the difference. So first, to position it in context of the world we live in today, we're living in very difficult times of extremism, anti-Semitism, anti-Israel, and with hate being so rampant, uh, it's very important that people understand the lessons of the Holocaust, and maybe this is the more important time for this to come forward. And we've heard previously and are aware of the fact that Jews are invariably the canary in the coal mine, foreshadowing violations of human rights and threats against democracy. We all always seem to be uh, susceptible uh, before others. So anti-Semitism is basically the element of prejudice or discrimination against Jews as a group or individuals. And um, we understand that anti-Semitism goes back centuries. Uh, without making this into a history lesson, we can recount the Assyrians occupy, occupying uh, the Judea uh, region and what we call Israel today. Uh, we're talking about 700 BCE. We all know about the Babylonians and the Babylonian exile and the dest destruction of the first temple in 586 of BCE. The Egyptians uh, resented the, uh, the uh, Exodus story. Uh, it painted them in a bad picture. Alexander the Great and the Greeks, the Romans and the Caesars, the church, Muslims, all have either conquered, discriminated, or persecuted Jews. So when it came to the Holocaust, it really was nothing new. And whether Whoopi Goldberg chooses to call it racism, um, 
it definitely was by the Nazi definition all about the superiority of the Aryan race and that anyone who didn't live up to those standards that they had indicated of purity of blood, uh, that uh, those people could not pollute the purity of the German uh, people. So we know that anti-Semitism has been institutionalized in the church. There are still people today, despite the Pope uh, having a, uh, a encyclical, encyclical that indicated that the Jews did not kill Christ, it's still a popular set sentiment, whether we like to agree or admit it or not, it's still there. And so we know that this has been around for a long time and it's still among us today. Jews have been blamed for countless uh, numbers of uh, very, very emotional and, and frightening uh, situations that go back to blood libels in, in the Middle Ages, uh, the plagues, and Jews being blamed uh, for all of these horrific incidents. And the uh, that story of uh, the blood of uh, Christian children being used to make Passover matzahs, uh, uh, sec uh, um, desecrating sacramental wafers and so on. The church uh, made uh, anti-Semitism a central feature. Uh, we know there are churches that still exist today that continue to operate with uh, many of these prejudices. Uh, it continued through the Reformation um, and essentially uh, when Martin Luther published The Jews and Their Lies, um, uh, this was something that the Nazis reprinted in 1935, indicating that it was uh, a, a blood purity issue. Uh, we also know that in the 13th century, Jews were required to wear a badge. So again, the Nazis appropriated this. This was nothing new when it came to the Holocaust. These were things that had been done centuries earlier and so Jews were subjected to anti-Semitism. We know that the, uh, that the church did not allow Christians to loan money for a profit. And so Jews who were not allowed to own land had to resort to many money lending. Um, and this was a double-edged sword because it was resented as a profit center and also the anxiety over uh, Jews being portrayed as money hungry, uh, money lenders uh, profiting off of people that could ill afford it. The expulsions from countries, uh, England in, 19, in uh, 1290, France in 1394, um, and the famous expulsion from Spain in 1492, and on and on and on. Napoleon has sort of a um, double-edged situation in terms of a famous uh, or infamous decree of uh, July 1808, where Jews were assured of equality um, and it was a uh, actual breaking up of a great deal of what had preceded Napoleon in, in Europe. Uh, and Napoleon took the, the French Revolution ideas of liberté, égalité, equality, and fraternité applied it to the Jews. And so this was going to supposedly make life wonderful for, for Jews. But there were elements of that decree that uh, really created very harsh and difficult situations. Uh, this whole idea where money lending was, a money any 
money lending was required to have a uh, a a specific uh, a uh, a specific uh, certificate of uh, a license that had to be renewed annually, and so it made making uh, money lending a very difficult situation. It also it prohibited Jews from migrating or relocating within France uh, because it was mandated that in order to relocate or purchase land, um, anyone had to actually buy the land on which they would they would uh, they would dwell. And uh, Jews were also up until this time always called it just as you are in shul, you know, uh, let's say, uh, you know, Yosef uh, Ben Benjamin, you you were referred to in your in your ancestral format, but uh, this Nepo Napoleonic decree indicated that Jews would have to have a last name, but it couldn't be from the Hebrew Bible. And this was supposedly to integrate Jews into the society, but it also identified them clearly for taxation. And so it became very important. Um, and it also uh, is important that uh, Napoleon created this uh, national Israelite consistory. Um, and this was supposedly a good thing because Jews would be self-determining within their own uh, communities. But uh, the prefect had to uh, regulate these consistories. And so therefore it had uh, an authority above the self-determination um, but uh, it also is important that um, people are aware of the fact that uh, it also uh, was a part of the fact that Napoleon did advocate for an independent Jewish state in the Middle East. So uh, it's, it had its positives, but it also had its negatives. Um, anti-Semitism, the term that was coined by William Marr in 1873 from his work, The Victory of Judaism Over Germanism, uh, essentially created this word of anti-Semitism. And in Russia, uh, we had the infamous work called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the secret plot, which was a total fabrication of the plot by a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. That publication, Protocols of Elders of Zion, which has been uh, has been translated in countries all over the world, is still available and is being sold over the, on the internet today. It, it is. Uh, it it makes Jews out as these horrendous controlling uh, uh, figures that uh, are oppressors, and not only are they dangerous, they're dangerous to others because others will be subjected to this cabal of of Jews, and it's a uh, it's a a fabrication that has found its way into many, many hands, especially it's being used today by the, uh, the, the Nazis online. And so as a result, it becomes a, a very, a very serious, difficult work to, to deal with. We also know that social Darwinism uh, facilitated racism and anti-Semitism, pseudo-scientific uh, theories. There's the story in France of Alfred Dreyfus, who was uh, in, in was unjustifiably 
accused of um, of killing an innocent boy. It, uh, but even though he was found innocent, it was covered up, but it polarized all of France uh, into this pro or con on Dreyfus. We know that in Russia, Jews had suffered horrible pogroms. Um, and uh, there's the famous pogrom in Kishnev uh, uh, that was a, a serious problem. So the Holocaust, also called Yashoah, Yasho um, which is Hebrew for catastrophe, um, refers specifically to when Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany uh, all the way until the end, the official end of uh, World War II. Now, unofficially, uh, some people say that the start of the Holocaust would be traced to November, November 9th and 10th, 1938. Uh, the night of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Um, so even uh, even though it, it's not an official proclamation as such, many people felt that that state-sponsored um, uh, persecution of Jews was uh, unofficially the start of the Holocaust. So. Be beginning with Hitler's control of Germany, and I mean, once uh, he solidified the complete absolute control um, as chancellor, and then named Fuhrer, uh, the, that essentially enabled the Nazis to pass their legislation and to make the Holocaust the horror that it was. Had it not been for the police in Germany and every country that Germany occupied or waged in a war and then uh, were able to be successful in their victories over other countries, in every one of those countries, the local police and judges were collaborators, and they uh, they exercised as much anti-Semitic and and terror within their communities as did the Nazis. And if you want to see an interesting story on that, um, you can find it. Uh, now currently called the French Village, uh, which is on Prime, on Amazon Prime. And it demonstrates what happened in France with the collaborators uh, becoming the enforcers of the Nazi, uh, the Nazi uh, protocols that they instituted uh, as they, and the same thing was repeated in other countries as well. And then they, the Nazis did the same thing in the concentration camps with capos who were, in this case, Jews who were forced to operate in a, a police kind of, a, a, of a execution of Nazi, uh, Nazi orders. Um, and so I, I had mentioned that uh, regardless of what Whoopi Goldberg claims that uh, race was not beh behind the Holocaust, uh, we know that the, the concept of the Aryans' superiority that the Nazis embraced and made a central part of their propaganda campaign which was sadly extraordinarily successful, um, essentially was about the fact that these Aryan people, Germans, Northern Europeans, uh, were superior to Semitic people. And it was about blood, the purity of blood. And so therefore, 
systematically, Jews were marginalized, discriminated, restricted, then targeted for physical uh, harm uh, and and the uh, the Jews in all of the countries that were occupied were oppressed. Now, interestingly, despite the concentration camp, very strict rules and constraints, believe it or not, there were various ways of celebrating Hanukkah in camps. And people would take blocks of wood and carve uh, a, men a menorah or a Hanukkiah for Hanukkah. They would uh, make whip wicks from scraps of fat and loose threads. And they did devise ways of celebrating Hanukkah. So today being the last day of Hanukkah, I want to make sure that we have an understanding and, and put some of this into an additional context context. So Hanukkah um, is a celebration of courage. And so it's very important that Hanukkah, which is the military victory celebration over uh, the Greeks in Syria uh, in 167 before the Common Era, um, this whole message of courage uh, and bravery of the Maccabees is essentially what many people, many survivors and many people did, partisans and so on, did in the Holocaust. So during the Holocaust, you had essentially this same kind of courage demonstrated by people who were in the most oppressed manner, even humanly possible. And so while Hanukkah is celebrated in terms of the military victory of the Maccabees um, over their oppressors, we know that the survivors and partisans and the non-Jews, the righteous among nations, braved overwhelming odds and of frightening reprisals that uh, exhibited inordinate courage. We know the stories that occurred in Poland where the, where the Jews were the most oppressed and where the Polish people who started with a, with a, uh, a fertile anti-Semitic fervor um, were when people did stand up for Jews, it was not only uh, unusual, it was enormously courageous on their behalf because the punishment, even for giving Jews a loaf of bread was to be taken out into the street with your family, with your family and your, your children and your parents and your spouse and just shot in, in the street. So, you know, it's one thing to say, well, yes, I would stand up. I would be brave. You know, I would do something to help. But when it's your entire family's lives who are, are on the line, that kind of courage is truly um, extraordinary. So... <clears throat> We know that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was one of the more famous, was tied together with, uh, with another Jewish holiday of emancipation, of Passover. And we know that there was enormous courage demonstrated in the Warsaw Ghetto. So we know that even in the ghetto, uh, the far prior to the uprising, even Hanukkah, Hanukkah was celebrated in the Warsaw Ghetto, and people would uh, find a way 
to somehow celebrate Hanukkah even there. In Theresienstadt, which was the propaganda camp that the Nazis used outside of Prague, um, uh, there were still people who found a way to celebrate Hanukkah and make it significant as a demonstration of bravery. Even in Bergen-Belsen, um, people found a way to use those threads and fat to light Hanukkah candles that they fashioned. Uh, there was a, a story of a um, of a, a DP camp in which a ha Hanukkah was formed out of cartridge sc scraps and shell casings. It happened to be dedicated to General Joseph McNary, who was uh, Eisenhower's successor as U.S. Commander in Chief in uh, the Mediterranean theater in, in Germany. And there was a uh, inscription uh, stamped in or hammered into the brass Hanukkah that said a great miracle happened here or a great miracle happened there. And the question is, was that a reference to the rabbinic creation of the miracle of the Hanukkah oil lasting eight days, 400 years after the actual military victory? But um, was it a reference to the general's military prowess? Um, I also point out, just as the Maccabees created a uh, fundamentalist uh, position after their success, um, this great General McNary, uh, he, he himself had his own issues with recognizing uh, the abilities of minorities in the U.S. military. So uh, there, there seems never to be anyone that's 100% one way uh, as, a, uh, as a tzaddik or another. So talking about, uh, about these Jews who survived and their courage, the Holocaust didn't, we know, it didn't occur just upon arising on a given day. It was a process. It took a series of propaganda-led uh, uh, actions and so forth. It, it turned people from indifference. It turned people from being bystanders. It turned cer certain people into collaborators. And with all of these elements that occurred, there were people who managed to survive. And there are a few stories of survival that are good demonstrations of the kind of courage that it took to stand up, to be an upstander and not a bystander. So if anybody on this... Uh, presentation was that by ordination, you know, I spoke specifically in the context of uh, Leviticus 19.16, lo ta'amod al dam re'echa, do not stand idly by. It's one of my favorite biblical Hebrew Bible te texts. And there were people during the Holocaust who did not stand idly by. And so the courage of the Maccabees, in essence, you know, this idea of uh, standing up against what are seemingly insurmountable odds and obstacles uh, were demonstrated. So at Yad Vashem, the State of Israel's official memorial to the victims of the Holocaust, um, it defines Holocaust survivors as Jews who lived under Nazi control, directly or indirectly, and for any amount of time, 
and those who survived it. Now, some were in more desperate situations than others, but the important thing is that all of these survivors are heroes. All of these survivors are, are to be celebrated and their stories are, are, their messages are an eyewitness to history because they were actually there. Sadly, we are losing Holocaust survivors uh, at a very fast rate because of their advanced age. And a young survivor is one in their 80s. Most of the survivors are in their 90s, some even over 100. And so when we can learn from their stories that they can share with us, some of those get recorded as testimonies. And those are messages that we can learn from. So there are four particular survivors um, who are featured in this Holocaust Education Center that I'm involved in the project management of building and outfitting. Um, and one I would like to highlight is a survivor named Sam Holkainer who changed his name to Sam Hilton at the recommendation of his naturalization judge, who said, you know, Sam, you might consider changing your name to something a little more American. It might be easier for people to pronounce. And so Sam walked out onto Wacker Drive in Chicago, and he saw a Hilton Hotel. So he changed his name to Hilton and became Sam Hilton from that day afterward. Sam was actually in five different concentration camps. He was in Majdanek, a death camp, as a 12-year-old. Sam and his father in the Warsaw Ghetto threw Molotov cocktails that they made at the Nazis. Um, and he continually managed to survive death, disease, uh, every bad element. And he just continually kept these words in mind, never quit, persevere, never quit. And so that's that Sam's message to us today, never quit. Your perseverance and your uh, your continued efforts are the things that will enable you to survive and move forward. After all of his camp ex experiences and finally a death march to Theresienstadt um, after being liberated and coming to the U.S., Sam made a very worthwhile life for him and himself and his family. Um, uh, sadly, uh, I never got a chance to meet Sam, but I work with his son almost every day because his son is that, that individual that I mentioned who is making this inordinately large gift and the naming of this new Holocaust Education Center that we're building which will be known as the Hilton Family Holocaust Education Center. And Sam's son, Steve, follows in his father's footsteps. He never quits. He forever perseveres. Uh, and Sam's story is available. A, uh, a audio transcript is available uh, of his personal accounts of all of his experiences. Esther Bash. Esther uh, lives in Prescott, Arizona today. She's 95. Um, Esther was in the worst of situations on her 16th birthday. The train pulled into Auschwitz where she was separated from her parents and never saw them again. 
And in Auschwitz, who should she encounter none other than the angel of death, Joseph Mengele, who punched her in the stomach with his baton. Esther still has nightmares at age 95 about what Mengele did to her. And so she was scarred by that forever. And Esther is still traumatized by it. And Esther uh, survived and uh, ultimately moved uh, to what was then Palestine, later Canada, and then to Phoenix and Prescott. <clears throat> and Esther was um, one of the survivors who was starving and she came across a jar of honey and she was so ravenous that she consumed the entire jar of honey and became deathly ill as many of the many of the people who survived the camps did <clears throat> their bodies just couldn't take all of those uh calories uh and and foods into them without having an adverse effect so esther became very very ill and so the american liberators um nicknamed her the honey girl and so to, today, Esther has written a documentary film entitled The Honey Girl. And it will soon be available in early 2024. Uh, and it is her story. And Esther says she can forgive, but never forget. So she can find her way to forgive because of circumstances, but she will never forget. She'll never forget what was done. She'll never forget the camps. She'll never forget Mangala. And it will always be with her forever. Alex White, whose name was in Poland, Alexander Bialowicz. And uh, he Americanized it when he came to the U.S., changed it to Alex White. So Alex was in a ghetto in uh, Krosno in Poland, and he was able to survive by his skills that he had learned from his father in being a glazier. A glazier is a person that is able to work very smooth surfaces and be able to, uh, to make those surfaces very, very productive. And sometimes you need a very smooth surface. For example, in cookware, and uh, in enamelware. So there was a factory, um, uh, a factory owned by Oscar Schindler. And this factory had been a cookware factory converted into a munitions factory. And so using his skills as a glazier, Alex worked in Schindler's factory and was on Schindler's list. There were 1,200 people on Schindler's list, and Alex was one of them. So Oscar Schindler, um, essentially a member of the Nazi party and a profiteer off of the war, um, was using his work supplying the Nazis and he learned of what was happening to the Jews. So Schindler then, if you're familiar with the film that Spielberg made, protected the 1,200 Jewish workers by paying the Nazi officers um, bribery to allow him to continue 
with having these workers under the guise of they were necessary to produce munitions for the Nazi war effort. But it took his bribing them and using all of that money to bribe the officials. Oscar Schindler died penniless. Uh, he was later named and his wife were named Righteous Among Nations. Meanwhile, Alex, who managed to survive by working in Schindler's factory and being protect, protected by Schindler's listing of those workers that were considered essential uh, that Schindler protected, he was able to survive by working in Schindler's factory. And when the Americans liberated him, he came to the U.S. He had written a dissertation. He wa always wanted to be a doctor, and he became a doctor of internal medicine. And he practiced here in the, uh, in the uh, Phoenix area. And so the tools of his trade changed from the glazier tools to the tools of a physician. Uh, typical stethoscope, blood pressure, et cetera. And he, uh, he utilized those tools for the good and, and the health and, and the welfare of the people who were his patients. And I knew Alex, and he told me the most important thing in life was to be a mensch. which was the same thing my Zadie taught me. Be a mensch. You do the right thing, because it's the right thing to do. And sadly, Alex died last year at age 99. Didn't quite make it to his 100th birthday, but always maintained his sense of humor and his integrity. Last but not least, Oscar Noblach. We had a birthday party for Oscar two weeks ago <clears throat> for his 98th birthday. And um, he still lives in Phoenix. He still speaks loud and clear, completely cogent, and fairly active physically. And Oscar is the subject of a USC Shoah Foundation Dimensions and Testimony Holographic Technology, where people who visit our current gallery are able to ask Oscar questions because he sat down two years ago for five days, six hours a day, under the hot lights and answered 2,000 questions about his life and his experience of being in the ghetto, of being a slave in Gestapo headquarters, uh, where he did everything from shoveling coal to, bear, to loading bodies onto carts. Um, he has many people to thank for his survival in the ghetto in Krakow. One day, the person who he was a helper, uh, a helper with uh, hauling trash to the dump outside the city, outside the ghetto, said to him, you take the cart and you go and you take the the horse and the cart and the trash out to the out to that dump and don't come back all day. Stay away all day and don't come back till nighttime. Oscar said, why? He said, just trust me. You don't want to be here th today. And the reason was is that that person had heard that the street that Oscar lived on in the Krakow ghetto, that that was going to have all of the people removed and sent uh, to Mauthausen. So 
he was very lucky uh, in that regard. And he tells a million stories, and I wish I could share them with you, but he's written a book called The Boy's Story in a Man's Memory, which is beautifully written. And it, it tells his story. When he was a, a slave in that in that uh, in that in that Gestapo headquarters, when any officer walked into that uh, into that room, if he was in there cleaning, no matter what he was doing, he immediately had to go to the nearest wall, press his nose against it, and stand there and say absolutely nothing until spoken to. And it didn't matter whether it was 10 minutes or 10 hours. He had to stand there and not speak, not move. Oscar says, be an upstander. Never be a bystander. Always stand up and speak out. Always Stand by, do not leave, do not stay silent. And fulfilling lo tam odo dam recha, do not stand idly by. And that's his message. I talk to him regularly and I'm proud to share his story. So you have four survivors. And they made choices and they made a difference and continue to make a difference, a difference with our humanistic values of resilience, courage, respect, incredible endurance, forgiveness, integrity, honor, and hope. Never quit, forgive, but never forget. Be a mensch and be an upstander, never a bystander. Thank you. That was if very powerful. There are any questions or comments, please, please share if you uh, if you can. Folks want to put their hands up or just unmute. Rick. Yeah, that was incredibly inspiring. And thanks for all the personal uh, vignettes. Uh, really important. And, uh, you know, we're in Hanukkah and we have uh, the Maccabee story to inspire us. But you know, as humanistic Jews, uh, we not only uh, look to the Maccabees or, you know, the, the, the story of a Passover to inspire us, but also how Jews have lived uh, through the millennia uh, and uh, uh, fought back or uh, found in their own way how to uh, survive. And I thought it was interesting uh, that you had I can't remember talked about uh, uh, all Jews who live through these horrors as as heroes, regardless of what they did. All Jews who live through the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, I was wondering what you think about it, because, you know, of course, Jews survived in many ways where we, you know, look back at those who who, you know, found ways to resist. But there also are those who collaborated. Uh, and those who escaped uh, and really just, you know, saved themselves, but not necessarily others. So could you just give us some of your feelings about that? Uh, uh, thank you, Rick. Um, I will say that I have personally met and spoken with 65 survivors. And yes, some were in hiding and some escaped and fled. We know about capos in the camps who literally performed the work of Nazis and 
many were vicious and they assured their own survival. I try and put myself into their shoes. What would I have done if my entire family was in jeopardy of being murdered? How would I react? It's very easy for me to look back in retrospect and say, well, you know, I would stand up. I would refuse to do that. I wouldn't collaborate. I wouldn't flee uh, and so on. Easier said than done. These were incredibly traumatic times. And I don't know if any of us can literally put ourselves into the shoes of those people and possibly imagine what it took to survive. And there were those who just suffered all of the indignities. Read Primo Levi. I mean, I'm, you know, every time I get in the shower and I complain that the water's too cold or something, I think about the fact that there were people that, you know, were hosed down or so, something and, you know, lucky to have anything at all. They, they, had, they had nothing to look forward to other than, a, than the next day of horror. Um, all of these people, some did whatever it took to survive. And I can't be, I cannot be judgmental on what it took because of how terrible it was. Uh, I didn't tell the story of Gerda Weissman Klein, a rock star among survivors. I knew, I knew Gerda, she just died two years ago. I, I was in her home. She, uh, she wrote a book that uh, is now in its 77th printing and on the bestseller list in Poland, being translated into Polish. She was a recipient from President Obama of the Medal of Freedom. Her, her, her book was made into a film and won an Academy Award for the best short subject. It won an Emmy and so on. One day, Gerda had a blueberry, one blueberry. That's all she had. And at the end of it, she carried it with her in her pocket, looking forward to savoring it that night. And because Gerda hadn't eaten that entire day. And then she met a woman who hadn't eaten for three days. She gave her the blueberry. How can we imagine what it was like? I, I can't, I can't possibly. So I can't judge them. That's my answer to you, Rick. I'll, I have a question, and I, I know we're going a little bit mm -hmm. over time, but um, so one of the themes that I'm always taking out of um, humanistic Judaism and certainly Sherwin Wine's teaching is hope and courage. So obviously the courage piece, I think we've covered a lot, but you know, it's, and I've, I've done a lot of reading on the Holocaust and it's really hard not to feel hopeless. So, you know, and I think you, you did pull out the, the lessons beautifully, the humanistic lessons, but maybe you can kind of end us on a, on a way that you pull hope out of it all. Um, if there is a way to. Well, th thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, I uh, I think that the stories of survival, the fact that people went on to make enormously productive lives, uh, the fact that they suffered this trauma in their youth that would have caused most of us to just curl up in bed under the covers and not want to come out. These people managed to pick themselves off, pick themselves up and dust themselves off and not only make hope, make lives for themselves, have families, but also contribute to society. And, and th those stories are inspirational. They're hopeful. The fact that people are able to do that is incredible. And um, I think we can take a lesson from that. And, uh, you know, we, we look all around us, we see some very troubling times that we see on a daily basis going on all around us. 
you know, as Jews in America, we are targets of a global infatata today. And each of us, I think, is very concerned about that. We have to be courageous. We have to get up. We have to get out of bed. We have to go out and do things that are productive. And we have to maintain our values and be positive and hopeful. So I, I think it's something that helps us move from, put one foot in front of the other from one day to the next. I see this strange woman has her hand raised. <laughs> People are, uh, first of all, excellent job, Rabbi, which I knew you would do. People are, are contacting me in the chat and they'd like to know the name of Gerda's book, if you have that available. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll put it in the chat. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Uh, it's called, it's called so All But My Life is the title. All but, but my I, life. All but my life by Gerda Weissman Klein, K L E I N. Um, I, I don't have the publisher or that information at, at hand. I would have to send it. But I'm sure if you Google uh, All But My Life or you Google Gerda Weissman Klein, you're going to have access to it. And okay, her name, just... is, yeah. The name is in the in the PowerPoint also, which you generously offered to oh. share with anyone who emailed you. So if you if you want the PowerPoint, um, you can get it, and then you can see her name and plug her into um, Amazon, and I'm sure you'll find the book. Okay, I just put it into the chair. Oh, great! Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That was excellent, and we will of course put the recording up in the next couple of days and share it out on our listserv, and we will let folks know about. The next upcoming session, which we're trying to do this noon Eastern on Thursday, every second Thursday of the month. And, I, and we've got different people lined up through the summer. So we're excited to share that. But we really appreciate this, Jeffrey. It was fascinating and moving. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for having me. Thank all of the people who are here today. Thank you for being a participant. And thank you just share the word. I mean, that's all it takes, you know, share what you've heard and, and maybe we can all make a difference. Thank you. And we'll see you in 2026 for the opening of the Holocaust Museum. Absolutely. Now. Please do. Please. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Thank you.